to my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. So I think most people, I imagine most people on this webinar know at least a little bit about Smarking, but uh, we are a tech company uh, providing software solutions to the parking industry. We have three primary products. One is a business intelligence tool where we integrate with parking garage uh, tech stack and provide data analytics um, to them. Second is our smart pass platform that is a digital flexible parking program. And then third, the focus of today's discussion is uh, dynamic pricing. Ours is called AIM, Automated Yield Management. It's one we launched uh, four years ago, so we were one of the first to bring it to market in 2018. It's currently empowering hundreds of parking garages, primarily in the United States. And it can work across many channels, but it's primarily used today through our partner ParkWiz on the ParkWiz channel. So we, uh, we've designed this webinar to answer four questions. One, what is dynamic pricing and why should I, someone in the parking industry, care? Two, what does it mean in the context of parking? We've heard a lot of different definitions of what dynamic pricing is. So we're going to go ahead and define it from Smarking's perspective. Three, what are keys to success with the dynamic, uh, dynamic pricing program? And we'll provide some examples with that. And then four, how do I go ahead and get started? So we'll go through each of these sections. Please ask questions in the chat box as we go along. And at the end of each of these sections, I'll pause, look at the questions, and we'll have a Q&A on them. So let's start with what is dynamic pricing and why should I care? Well, we'll get into a little bit uh, more specific definition for the parking industry, but at its highest level, dynamic pricing is a pricing strategy that uses variable pricing instead of fixed pricing. So on the left-hand side, that's historical pricing in the parking industry and others, where the price itself is static, um, regardless of what the demand is at that given moment. When demand is high, demand is low, doesn't matter, the price is gonna be the same. Dynamic pricing flexes the pricing to incorporate what is the demand at any given moment or predict it in the future. So when demand is high, you push that uh, price up a little bit, trying to get more revenue per transaction. And when it's low, you bring that price down a little bit, trying to capture volume that you wouldn't otherwise capture with that static price. This is um, a tool that is used extensively today across many industries, uh, especially in adjacent industries like transportation and leisure. So it got started uh, decades ago in the airline industry. Others uh, in the leisure space like hotels, cruises and trains fast followed. You're now seeing it with rental cars, ride share with their surge pricing, sports arenas, uh, and increasingly in e-commerce as well. We believe uh, the time is ripe right now for dynamic pricing and parking for three primary reasons. And I'll elaborate on each of these. First is your competitors are becoming smarter with their pricing strategies. Two is consumers are increasingly purchasing digitally and are much savvier with price transparency to make their decisions. And three, from a practical standpoint, it's much more straightforward now to implement dynamic pricing. A decade ago, it would have been nearly impossible. So let's go through each of these in a little bit more detail. First, your competitors are becoming smarter with their pricing strategies. If we look back 10 years ago uh, in the pre-smarking days, pre-business intelligence in general, there wasn't much data on your own garages, let alone your competitors. But today, just as consumers have price transparency, so do your competitors. What you're looking at here is um, a online rate survey that Smarking provides to our customers in our business intelligence tool, where you can look at the online rates of all your nearby competitors relative to you. And you can see at the top here, you can compare rates by sales portal. You can look at weekdays versus weekends or specific days. You can look within a quarter mile of your garage, a mile of your garage, and then you can look at by specific times of day and duration. And you can see what are you charging versus what are your competitors are charging. This type of data granularity is allowing for much more sophisticated pricing strategies. 
So if you're not looking at this level of detail, it's, it's likely that your competitors are. And as a result, uh, you need to be more sophisticated with your pricing if you want to be competitive at all times of the day and week. Similarly, just as competitors have this information, consumers do as well. Over the past few years, we've seen a, a little bit of a macro shift in how um, parkers are behaving. If we just look at a very high level of off-street parking volume, uh, we smarking have access to uh, over 2,500 garages. So we can look at uh, North America trends on a holistic level. Um, and you can see here, off-street parking volume remains 25% below pre-pandemic levels. So this is looking at monthly change relative to 2019. You can see as recently as August, we're still about 25% below pre-pandemic levels in terms of volume of off-street parking transactions. But when you isolate specific channels, there's one that has come up clearly as a winner in the past few years, and that's the online channel. Online parking is up about 40% above pre-pandemic levels, and, and consumers are increasingly shifting to those digital channels. Those are the aggregators like the spot here's the park whizzes, the parking.coms, as well as many garages today have their own, um, their own online reservation tools. These are becoming increasingly utilized by consumers and it's reflected in the data here. The thing about that online channel though, is that it is very price transparent. So I just took this screenshot from ParkWiz yesterday. I live in Washington, DC. So I just looked at downtown DC and and let's say that I was going to Ford's Theater, which you can see um, on, this, on this map. It's very price transparent what garages I'm going to go, uh, what garages I have access to. And on the online channel, decisions are primarily made by price and location. There are some tertiary reasons around uh, user reviews and uh, surface lot versus garage and whatnot. But by and large, it's price and location. So if I'm going to Ford's Theater here, I'm probably not going to those two on the upper part of this page that are 72 and 48 bucks. I'm crossing those off my list. So um, now I'm looking at the three in the middle here. Which one would you click on first? I'd probably click on that $34 one. And unless something stops me and it's unlikely to, I'm just gonna choose that $34 one. So, so consumers have access to these, to this level of pricing detail. And if you want to capture volume, you need to be competitive. Now, that's not to say that in this example, $34 is the right price. Uh, it looks to me like they're in this, in this very specific example that they're leaving money on the table. They could probably charge 37, 38, 39, 40 bucks, and I would still, uh, I would still park there. Um, so it's not to say that this is the right one, just that there is a level of price transparency that uh, you need to consider and that dynamic pricing can account for. And then third, um, as I mentioned, pre the digitization of the parking industry, it would have been nearly impossible to implement dynamic pricing. Today, it's pretty straightforward on the online channel specifically. And that's because we have the data to get it right. Uh, we have the data of your own garages to know what's happening, when's volume and demand and capacity and all those types of things, if your competitors um, prices and whatnot. So we have the data to understand, to feed into the algorithm to, for it to accurately predict what demand will be. We have the means to distribute and publish updated rates uh, automatedly, so on an automatic basis. So that's one of the big reasons why this is used today on online channels and not so much for, for drive ups. You need a way to distribute. So the algorithm needs to feed the rates to wherever they're going to be um, consumed. And then they need to be published. And this is something that's very straightforward on the online channel. As I mentioned, we are partners with Arrive and ParkWiz. So our algorithm feeds directly to ParkWiz and it publishes new rates automatically. And then third, we, with that algorithm and sophistication, we have the means to continuously update it. So the algorithm is doing it itself without human intervention. That is something that wouldn't have been possible without numbers one and two here. But with it, um, we now have the means to make do this very straightforward. 
for, for us, if you wanted to launch dynamic pricing on Parkways, we can get it up and running within a day. So let me pause there. Paul, do we have any questions so far before we get to the next session? Yes, uh, we do. We have two questions. So the first one is from Andrew Sachs. Who is your favorite client? <laughs> Hello, Andrew. Good to see you. You know it's Harbor Park Garage in Baltimore. <laughs> that is uh, Andrew's par uh, garage, yes. <laughs> uh, and the second one is uh, from Walt Gray. What are the means to publish this info other than reservations? What are the means to publish the information? So for us, it is the online channel and it's through Parkways. So we have a, an API integration with them where we have, I'll skip ahead a little bit. Um, we have essentially this, this detailed table and it is just pushing rates to um, the platform and the consumer themselves, if they are, um, if they're looking for a certain time and duration, it's going to choose which of these rates to pick from uh, based on what that reservation time uh, and duration was. So um, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. If not, please, uh, please clarify or ask a follow up and I'll get to it in the next uh, section. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, I've heard a lot of different definitions of dynamic pricing and parking. So what I'd like to do today is go ahead and try to define it. What do we mean when we talk about dynamic pricing and parking? Well, to me, here's my definition of it. It is an automated way to continuously optimize prices to meet your goals subject to your constraints. Um, now that sounds a little wonky, so let's break down the four components of that one at a time. First, it's a way to meet your goals. And I think this is really important. When we, um, when we set out to partner with uh, a garage owner or operator, the first question we ask before we activate is, what are your site goals, just in general? And then how are you using um, our ch channel partner Parkways to achieve them? Typically, it is to maximize revenue. That is, that is the number one goal overall and for the Parkways channel. Uh, and that certainly was the case during the pandemic, but it could get more nuanced than that. Um, how does that differ by day and time, for example? If you're gonna sell out a garage, if you're in New York City and you're gonna sell out a garage Tuesdays through Thursdays during, during 10 a.m., 11 a.m., just from commuters driving up, and that's a higher margin channel to you, you might not want to fill the garage with um, Parkways or another lower margin channel. So we want to work with you to meet your goals. So first and foremost, knowing what those goals are and communicating to them to us will help us um, plug into the algorithm accordingly what it should be pricing. And again, we live in a very data transparent parking world these days. Uh, our business intelligence tool can be used uh, to look at historical patterns to help agree on those goals. I think that the typical starting point is let's push on price, get a higher price during peak periods when demand is high uh, and occupancy is high and capacity is low, remaining capacity is low. And let's push on volume during off-peak times when it's all the opposite. Uh, we, have, uh, we can work with your site data to understand when those periods are. We can also feed that information to the algorithm. So it's a site-specific algorithm that's continuously learning about your specific site. So that's the first one. What are your goals? Subject to your constraints. So what we largely mean here is what guardrails, if any, do you need to feel comfortable and in control with the automated pricing? Because I think this is the big thing that people have a little bit of trouble giving up is they're used to knowing exactly what the price is at any given time. They feel in control of it and whatnot. And if you just let this... Um, let an algorithm dictate what prices are gonna be. Some people start to feel uncomfortable. So this is the second question we ask. The first is what are your goals? Second is what guardrails are gonna make you feel comfortable with letting an algorithm choose your pricing? And there are three common ones. Well, two of these three are more common than the other one, but 
The two common ones are price floors. So um, for example, never sell a ticket below $10 or I don't want a 24 hour duration ticket for less than 50 bucks or whatever it might be. This is a very common one and we set this up with you from, from day one. Um, the, the less common one, but occasionally we put we hear is, is price ceilings. So um, this is primarily used, don't gouge customers with crazy prices that will result in bad reviews. Again, not one that we hear as much, but we typically do put it in a price ceiling just to make sure you don't get some crazy price that a consumer can screenshot and put it on a user review or whatnot. And then third is max capacity. So um, to better control how many transactions you're pushing through any one channel, in our case, ParkWiz, you can set capacity limits on how many of those reservations can be made at one time. So you're able to put constraints into the algorithm that allow it to let allow you to be a little bit more in control than you otherwise would be. And we typically do it in bright red boxes for floors and ceilings of like, Again, these aren't base rates. These are guardrails that the algorithm will bump up against and will never go below or above. And that's good for providing peace of mind to, to people who are giving up the control of pricing to a, to a model. So we have your goals, we have your constraints. Then we're used to continuously optimize prices. And again, that is meant to... Um, predict parking demand for each hour. So the algorithm has all this historical information. It knows last Tuesday from nine to 11 a.m. what happened and the 15 Tuesdays before that. And it's able, it's continuously learning. So it's a machine learning algorithm. It's able to predict uh, on Tuesdays and then for every other day and every hour of that specific day, what is demand likely going to be? And it prices accordingly, feeding those um, prices into the Parkwiz channel in our case. So here's an here's a example of a rate card. The uh, columns are durations. So the first column is a one hour duration. And then the hour is time, time of day. So you can see in the green there, the algorithm in this example has identified the same demand and price for a one hour stay from noon to three. But then starting at four, demand starts to drop off and the price is coming down a little bit because in this case, the owner is seeking to grow volume. It's looking to capture transactions that they probably wouldn't have captured at $10.68, but they're more likely to capture $8.53 at 4 p.m. And when demand really drops off at 5 p.m. at $5.72. So it's constantly updating its price. And then fourth, uh, and importantly, it's an automated way. I've heard a lot of examples of dynamic pricing, um, examples where really it's just sophisticated rate cards, where you have a weekend rate card and an early bird rate card and a weekday off peak rate card. And then if you're a New York City downtown garage, maybe you have a Monday, Friday rate card that's a little bit different than Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because of the hybrid worker, they're not coming in as much on Monday, Fridays. So those are all great and more sophisticated pricing strategies and static pricing, but that's not dynamic pricing. Dynamic pricing is predicting, is continuously learning, is a machine continuously learning and feeding the correct, what it believes is the correct price on an ongoing basis. So this is what we call our ART, our automated rate table. Uh, and it has constant behind the scenes updates pushed to ParkWiz. So that if a consumer looks now, another consumer in an hour or two, it might look a little bit different for them. And this is only showing for 10 hours today. So, uh, so a human does not have the time or the ability to continuously update these prices as effectively as an algorithm does. So let me pause there. Let me just go back to the definition. And then Paul, if we have questions, we'd love to answer them. Yes. Uh, we have three questions this time. So another one from Walt Gray. So only consumers that have access to the ParkWiz platform would have access? Uh, in our case, yes. It's an, it's an open platform. As long as a garage is on ParkWiz, they just go to parkwiz.com. What they typically do in the, in the case of ParkWiz is, um, like, like if I go back to my example, 
I just I just went on parkwiz.com here. I entered an address and then I clicked map view instead of list view. And then it'll show all the, all the garages that are on there. And then if you want to choose one, you just uh, you create an account, put in your credit card info, um, and um, and you can purchase that garage space. So they've all all these all these ones in this example have partnered. The the garage itself has partnered with Parkwiz. Parkwiz and Spot Hero are, are two of the common ones. They're called aggregators. You also have other ones like Park Chirp um, or operator specific ones. Um, the, the, the big point here is that like because of these reasons, uh, online is where dynamic pricing is typically happening today. Uh, the next one from Getachu to Tesfe, I believe that's. Uh, how do you market manual operation sites for dynamic pricing? How do you market? Manual operation sites for dynamic pricing. So how do you market manual operation sites for dynamic pricing? Yes. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, if there are if there are constraints that you have up front, like let's say that it is a valet lot instead of a self park lot, we want to understand those up front. So oftentimes this max capacity will be influenced by factors such as that. Like we we only have so many we only only have so many employees at certain periods. So we need to make sure that we're not pushing vol, even if it's an off peak time. We just don't have the the um, the people power to actually park all those cars at one time. So it's one of those questions that we like to ask up front and should um, influence what guardrails go in, whether it be a floor ceiling or a max capacity here. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I'm not positive that answered your question. If not, please feel free to ask a follow-up and I'll try to answer it in the next round. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next one from Simon Bustow. How does dynamic pricing work in conjunction with building tenants that have validation systems at a certain price? For example, if a tenant validates a visitor's part pricing and expects it to be $20, but then they get a bill for it and it's $28, I assume there is an override in place for validations. Yeah, so the way that, that ours works is it's with, it's with the Parkwiz channel specifically. So those are in advance reservations. So um, there wouldn't be a voucher or a ticket system or anything like that that um, would have a conflicting price for them. Now, there are cases going back to these subject to your constraint guardrails where, um, where people want are conscious about what they are selling to their, um, selling to their uh, parkers in terms of drive up rates, uh, tenant specific rates and whatnot. And they wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want the algorithm to price differently. So as if one of those parkers found out about it, that they would be uh, upset or disappointed. So um, that's again, one of those goals that you want to understand from the outset. A lot of times a goal is, I just want well, for an operator is, I just want my, op my owners to be happy and the owner cares about the tenants in the building. So as long as the tenants are, are happy, then the owner's happy. So don't, don't do anything that's going to upset the tenant. So that's an under, that's a goal to understand. For example, other times it is I have a published drive up rate of fourteen dollars for early birds. So don't price below fourteen dollars because I want that to maintain that. So setting these parameters to align with that is is one thing that we recommend doing up front, and one thing that we do up front. Yes. Uh, we actually have three more questions, but what I'm going to do is just do the follow-up from Getachu and uh, Jerome, who got his in a little bit earlier, and then Jeff uh, will get yours after the next session or the, the next section. So uh, the follow-up from uh, Getachu, it could be valet or self-park without park system. And his original question was, how do you man market manual operation sites for dynamic pricing? It could be valet or self-park without park system. So again, for our uh, AIM automated yield and management product that's partnered with ParkWiz, the garage itself would need to be a ParkWiz uh, partner in order for, for us to be able to dynamically price through the ParkWiz channel for them. So, um, so if they don't have a park system, it's 
I'm guessing it's unlikely that they are a ParkWiz partner. Uh, if they are, then it's a QR code that they can show to, uh, they're, they're booking through ParkWiz a reservation. We're pricing the reservation dynamically. When they show up, it's whatever ParkWiz in the garage itself have, has agreed on in terms of validate that ticket. So it has QR codes and whatnot that it can, um, that, a, that a person on site can manually check in as they show up. Nice. And then the last one, the last question for now from Jerome Lafave. Do you have any experience with dynamic pricing for show up drivers who have not made a reservation? How do you display the current rates in that case? We do not. Um, I suspect that the industry is going to get there in, in a few years. It, it is a little bit more challenging because of really number two here, the means to distribute and publish uh, on an automated basis. So you need digital signage um, to be able to up to be able to update in in real time. Um, you need an API to that digital signage that um, the algorithm would push updated rates that can be reflected on the digital signage. Um, it's not something that we're doing today. They're also um, depending on the market, there are some regulations around um, published rates and whatnot that you have to consider um, for, for drive up rates. And um, the consumer behavior is a little bit different for drive ups too. So for those reasons, it isn't very common today. Um, number two here, I think once that's solved, the other ones are solvable as well. Um, and I think over the coming couple of years, people will start to experiment with it and, and probably try to implement dynamic pricing for drive ups a little bit more. But it's not too common today, and it's not something that that we at Smarking are doing. Nice. So um, let's talk about some some examples of success. And let me just start with um, what I've seen as as best practices, and and conversely, the pitfalls to avoid. So again, I think best practices is agreeing on that channel specific goals. So when we've seen sites uh, not perform well on dynamic pricing, it's due to not understanding or not communicating those goals. Um, because again, this is an algorithm, but you want you can design the algorithm, you can tweak the inputs to better um, achieve your goals. So having that conversation up front is going to be a best practice to ensure success. Number two, far and away, the biggest reason that when we don't see success with dynamic pricing, is when um, we don't establish the right guardrails, um, or more specifically, when we establish guardrails that are far too narrow to let the algorithm truly price effectively. We'll often get some, uh, some customers who do dynamic pricing, but then they think about it more like a base rate that they try to price with like super tight guardrails right, across, right around that base rate. And really that's not, true dynamic pricing um, because what you often find is the algorithm bouncing off those floors and ceilings, not getting to the true market rate that, um, that would better reflect demand. So that is, that is bar, far and away the pitfall to avoid in our opinion is set guardrails of what you feel comfortable with, but then give the algorithm a shot. And, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised once you do to see that it's achieving your goals. And then third, best practices, you know the saying, set it and forget it. This is close, it's set it, but don't truly forget it. Um, a pitfall to avoid here is make sure you do communicate realities that an algorithm can't possibly know to us and, um, and we'll make sure that they're factored in. So like, for example, if there's construction limiting capacity, so floor two is out of commission or whatnot, the algorithm doesn't know construction exists. There's no way that they can know. You um, letting us know that we can alter the, temporarily alter the goal of uh, uh, the, the capacity for the site, or we can either pause rates for the site if we need to or whatnot. So um, it's, it's forget it from a, I have to think about specific prices perspective, but don't, don't forget about the channel as a whole.
So a few case studies. Um, so this one's published on our website so we can reveal the, the customer. Uh, one of our key partners is ABM. Um, they launched uh, AIM across a number of their sites in, in 2020. And really they use it as a channel to, to boost volume and revenue during the, the, the lowest points of COVID. So you can see here, they launched it right in March, 2020. The dark blue bars are 2020. The light blue bars are the same month, the prior year, 2019. So March and April, 2020, when shelter in place was, uh, uh, when shelter in place was in place, the uh, revenue kind of fell off. But then come June, July, August, um, these are during the, this is during the summer of 2020, the like peak pandemic period. Parkwood's volume was over 2x relative to what it was in pre-pandemic 2019 at this type of site. So this is just an example, and you can see the quote here from, from John, who's the senior branch manager there. Not only was it 2x revenue, but they didn't have to spend time or resources trying to figure out what the pricing should be during this very crazy and unknown time. So not only generate revenue, but it saved time and resources on their end. So this is just an example of how effective dynamic pricing can be to optimally price based on predicted demand at any given time. Another example, this is a similar lens. Uh, we had a Boston, um, a Boston operator who significantly accelerated their revenue when AIM was activated relative to, to pre-AIM. So of course, during pandemic, anyone was looking for any way to try to capture volume. So that was usually the typical goal. How can we increase volume and, and revenue through AIM? And we, sit, we saw success from most of our garages doing that. A few more like specific examples. Again, maximizing revenue is just one goal, especially as we come out of, um, out of the pandemic and, and garages are filling up occasionally and whatnot, we start to get into a little bit more sophisticated sub goals too. So in this case, we were working with a client who um, likely had demand for like for weekend traffic, but they just weren't capturing any of it. So one thing my team and I do at Smarking is we do a managed service on top of the algorithm to make sure that the guardrails, for example, are set in place. And we do a lot of analysis on the site to understand when are you capturing demand and whatnot. And this site, um, we did a price assessment. And really the issue was um, the floor ceilings were a little bit off, specifically on the floor side of things. The algorithm was trying to price at rates, at more competitive rates than uh, the floor was allowing them to do. And with, we, we saw the data from the garage that, hey, they had plenty of capacity to accept a lower price to get those uh, cars in the, in the garage. So we recommended updates to those guardrails. And you can just see the one week after we implemented um, the nice part about like having this level of data visibility is you can see results pretty, pretty near immediately. And in this case, it was a 292% um, increase in revenue from one weekend to the next, just from a simple change like that. A second example, this was just a few weeks ago, I was speaking with a DC client um, that um, implemented AIM, but Parker's revenue was low out of the gate. Um, they wanted to know why. So we assessed performance and competitor rates and, and similar issue with their floor ceilings. They were trying to price um, in terms of what they thought price should be as opposed to what the algorithm predicted demand to be and pricing accordingly. So um, we did an assessment. We agreed on a new dynamic pricing strategy. You can see the blue dot there. Uh, the week of September 26 is where the new strategy went into effect. Um, the few weeks before that, they were doing less than 100 bucks a, a week in Parkways revenue. The two weeks after, uh, they did almost 1,000 bucks in each of those weeks. So 560% increase in, in revenue just from a dynamic pricing and updating the guardrails there. Um, again, a, a nice part of this is you can see data in, in, in real time. So we had a New York City operator who um, temporarily shut off AIM at one of their uh, locations. They had it on a number of locations, but wanted to shut off AIM at one just to see what happens. Uh, and you can see when it was shut off, revenue at the site 
uh, immediately started decreasing. Um, and we continued to meet with them on a regular basis. And then in late July, they said, okay, let's bring it, <laughs> let's bring it back. And at that point, you just see the first two weeks after it was uh, reactivated, the revenue of the site recovered. And then final case study I wanted to show, and then I'll, I'll take any questions from there is, these have all been revenue examples, but again, as we as we come out of the pandemic, it's not always just about revenue, especially on since this is just one channel's revenue. Um, so we had a, a client um, last month who wanted to test um, AIM at six additional sites. And they said it very clearly at the outset, it's not just about total revenue for us on this channel. We also care about throughput, so how fast um, cars are turning over in the garage, and then average hourly price. So not revenue per transaction, but accounting for duration as well to get down to an average hourly price. So um, we trialed AIM at six sites. We measured the impact on those three KPIs, and you can see the month over month change on this page. Uh, five of the six sites, we were able to significantly improve the performance. It doesn't work all the time. We're not trying to hide anything with the data. In this case, one of the six garages wasn't performing well. The reason for that uh, we deduced was they just didn't have enough ParkWiz volume for the algorithm to effectively price. So for us, typically you need about 50 or more online transactions a month on the ParkWiz channel for, for the algorithm to truly be effective. This wasn't really reaching that, so we weren't really getting much, we weren't getting any lift from, uh, from AIM. So we we're able to show the results and we kept going on five of the six uh, sites with, with the program. So those are a few, few case studies of how it works and how you can adjust it to impact uh, your KPIs. Paul, Paul, I'll pause there and take any questions that we have. Yes. Okay, so we got four questions. So from Jeff Spicker. Sorry, I checked in a little late. So is this just for ParkWiz Spot Hero online reservations? There is no integration with parks and or electronic rate signs. Also, are there additional fees for turning this on? Yes. Um, so, yeah, we covered at the beginning that right now it is for the online channel only. Um, and that is because it is, because it is the most straightforward way to distribute the prices and to publish them. I think event in the near term or near to medium term, it will come to drive up some sales. To, um, but you need a you need a means to API push prices in real time to digital signage, and you need that digital signage that is going to reflect updated rates. So the dynamics there are a little bit different than online. Um, you're seeing it on Parkwiz, you've seen it on Spot Hero, you've seen dynamic pricing on some of the operators own online channels as well, but that's a more natural place to start than drive up. So right now it's online, but I think eventually it'll get to, to drive up as well. Uh, we do charge a fee on top of um, on top of the typical park whiz rates, but what we do is we offer a trial period, uh, no obligation trial period, where you see how it works. We provide a performance and ROI assessment, and then you decide whether you want to keep it going or not. So no obligation, no risk trial to see um, to see effectiveness before you have to to make a, a cash decision. Yeah. From Dean Holmes, you referenced boosting volumes in the ABM example. Was this driven by an improvement in conversion rate because of optimized pricing, or does the Arrive platform help stimulate web traffic? If so, how? Yeah, it's 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 both. Um, so the aggregators are effectively a marketing channel um, to capture to capture consumers that you as a garage probably otherwise wouldn't capture. That's the reason that most garages or many garages use the aggr aggregators, whether they be a Spot Hero or Park Wiz or um, a Park Chirp. They have consumers that go on to the app and look for parking and they'll reserve in advance, it's unlikely they would have driven up and come to your garage otherwise. So it's used as a marketing channel uh, and they have their own methods to try to capture total number of people within a um, specific market. So that's one component is by partnering with them, you're able to capture volume, but of course they do take their cut for 
in exchange for that, that marketing channel, basically. Um, but then the second component and the one that we experienced is it really was the ability to, to price more effectively. So like in, in 2020, in that one example, there wasn't much high demand anywhere. There were no garages selling out in summer of 2020, but it was able to price effectively to capture the few parkers that were driving to um, downtown New York, able to price effectively, able to capture those demand relative to competitors just based on um, flex dynamic pricing. Uh, and then we have a three-parter from Dean Holmes. In the example of where your client uh, I didn't catch who asked where the revenue was too low and you confirmed the problem retrospectively. The improvement was marked. Does the algorithm not flag areas of underperformance and improve it in real time? To be clear on the last questions, does the algorithm not flag areas of underperformance and improve it in real time via new pricing? It does if you allow it to. So, in the, and by that, I mean, it will adjust if, you set your guardrails, as long as those guardrails are wide enough for it to price and adjust what it thought the price, the, the example should be, uh, or excuse me, what the price should be, then it adjusts in real time. Prices are pushed regularly um, to the, new prices are pushed regularly from the algorithm to, in our example, the ParkWiz channel. The issue here is, and this was a new, um, this was a new general manager that took over for the site. The prior GM had um, set their own guardrails. I think I would say going back to number two, pitfall to avoid, they tried to set these base prices with tight guardrails and the prices were just, were not, were not competitive um, with, uh, with nearby garages. So the algorithm would regularly just hit that floor and we're just flatline at that floor, even though it wanted to go lower than that. And that floor was very high relative to competitors. So after establishing that and establishing that um, this, this garage had plenty of capacity to take incremental parkers from Parkways, we were able to adjust um, those floor and just not base prices, just the floor and ceiling. And that allowed the algorithm to automatically adjust the price to where it predicted the demand to be. Nice. Uh, we have four more questions now, but I will uh, pause the, the Q&A for after the next session. So we're going to get to you, uh, Dean Holmes and Faisal Eskender, and in just a little bit. Okay, I just have one more slide really of, of how do I get started with, with dynamic pricing. And for us, it's, it's marking aim. Um, as I mentioned, like it's it's very straightforward these days um, to launch dynamic pricing on the online channel. Like how it works for us is we we um, we can launch it within one to two business days. You let us know which sites. We do a quick evaluation to make sure that it hits that threshold of at least fifty transactions a month on the Parkways channel. Again, because if it's lower than that, it's our algorithm can't truly predict demand. You're just not getting enough volume through it for, for, the, for the algorithm to really know. So we do a, a quick assessment to make sure it makes sense. Um, and if so, like we, we partner with the Arrive Parkways team. Um, by your consent, we get access to your admin portal. Um, and then um, once we set the... We, we set those guardrails. We, we understand your site goals and any guardrails right up front. And then we can launch. Um, and once we push the button, within an hour, it'll start pushing the rates, new rates to Parkways. So that can all be done very, very quickly. As I mentioned, for, um, for new customers, we offer this trial period where no obligation, no cost, throw your sites um, with sufficient Parkways volume. Uh, onto AIM and let's let it run for a month. And then at the end of the month, um, again, as part of our managed services component, my team and I will do a performance assessment of the sites, uh, of each of the sites, um, whether they met your goals, uh, where it performed well, where it could perform better. And we'll just lay it out as we, as we, as the data show, as the data tells us. 
And then you decide which sites, if any, you actually want to proceed with on an ongoing basis. Um, and for those that you do have an ongoing basis, like we do charge a fee, but we give ongoing performance reviews and ROI assessments. And um, there is no set term limits to this. If you're not happy with performance, you can deactivate any site within with just one business day's notice. So that's it for everything I wanted to cover. So Paul, why don't we get to those, those questions and happy to answer anything else for the remainder of our yes. period. Yeah, and just to let everybody know, uh, I'm recording this session. I'm going to upload it to our YouTube channel and also our blog uh, by the end of the day. So if you missed anything, you can always just look back at our YouTube channel, which is uh, should be smarking with our little logo. Um, so from Dean Holmes, does the aggregator charge a commission? Aggregators in general charge a commission to, um, to the garage owner and operator. Those financial arrangements are between the aggregator and the and the, and their and their client. So I would reach out to those specific. If you have if you have volume and you're a market where those aggregators are, um, I would reach out to them and engage in in those conversations directly with them. Uh, from Faisal Eskander, how regularly does the algorithm factor in new data? It's an ongoing algorithm, so like. It, and it gets smarter as it goes on because it's capturing new data. When we turn it on, it has um, all of the historical data that um, because we plug in directly with ParkWiz via an API, it has all historical data. Um, and that's kind of its starting point. But on a ongoing basis, every day, it's, it's, um, it's learning, it's understanding that new information. And as I mentioned, it's therefore every hour pushing new rates to ParkWiz if it deems new rates are justified. I'm not saying every, every hour it's pushing new rates, but if they think there should be a change in a new rate, then it'll do that. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing machine learning algorithm. Nice. And it allows for large swings in a rate from one hour to the next, correct? It does. Yes. Again, as long as it's within your, your guardrails, the algorithm works as it predicts demand to be. Yes. Uh, and then from Dean Holmes again, does the system flag if the guard reels are incorrect? It does not. It's a great question, Dean. Um, that's where my team and I come in. Uh, again, we do regular performance assessments. That's been one of the big changes in our dynamic pricing program in the last few months since I've come on board is that managed services element um, to it. Before we got, we were much closer to a let the client set the base rate and just put a min max on top of that. But again, that resulted in very narrow guardrails. So right now we try to let the algorithm work more freely. And as part of our ongoing reviews, we uh, the human element flag if we think guardrails should be priced uh, or, or, or should be a little bit different. The one other thing I'll say is going back to this page, uh, both we have and you, a AIM client, have access to this online rate survey. So we look at um, actual ParkWiz usage. So when are people coming in? What, what time of day? What day of week? How long are they staying? And that usually tells us when, um, where the demand is. And if things look off, like, hey, the rest of the garage outside of the ParkWiz channel has a lot of early morning commuters, but ParkWiz is getting none, then we have a hypothesis that maybe the guardrails are off for mornings. So we can go into this competitive rate survey. We can look at 8 a.m. We can even isolate the ParkWiz channel and look at what other competitors are charging at ParkWiz during that time. And that gives us an informed viewpoint of whether we should change those guardrails. Nice. Next one, uh, also from Dean Holmes. Is the system mainly operated by the parking owner operator? Does Smarking offer services to help to optimize the rates on top of the AIM program? It, yeah, we do. Um, again, as part of as, as part of my managed services um, team, like we will come up with, we'll do an initial performance assessment of a site on the Parkways channel. Once we have that um, integration with them, we have access to all that data. So we'll do a, here's where the status quo is. We can even recommend the guardrails for you and whatnot. Um, and then we can, and then we can let it run. 
um, as part of that, um, do we help optimize the rates on top of AIM? Um, outside of AIM, we have our business intelligence tool, which has pricing uh, elements to it as well. But if you're if you're working specifically in AIM, we'll help you to optimize rates. Like we have hundreds of garages that are on this program, and we know typically what what works well and what doesn't. So um, if we think a guardrail is off or whatnot, we can make data driven recommendations to um, to um, to adjust it and try to optimize for your performance. Um, and I can see the the follow up. Um, once live, how regular are the performance reviews and who completes the reviews? Uh, it's really dependent on your needs. We have some customers who are a little bit skittish with low guardrails or lower than they expected. And when they lower the guardrails, we perform bi week even biweekly reviews. And then we adjust them like biweekly meetings to show what the results are from the prior two weeks. And we check them regularly um, in between those meetings. But a lot of people, this is closer to a set it and forget it, then I need to be super hands-on with this. So they just want um, kind of a monthly status report or even like a quarterly status report of, is this working? Are there any adjustments that you recommend and whatnot? So we work with you up front to understand how regular you want the cadence to be. And, and we go from there. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, Dean, it's fine. Uh, thank you very much for all the questions. Because uh, the last one is apologies for all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that is it for our Q&A. Uh, Kayvon, do you have anything else to add? Um, no, I, well, I forget. I forgot to put my email address on the screen. So let me, let me put that up. Um, I would just say, yeah, this is something... If we didn't cover your your quote, if I didn't sufficiently answer your question, or if you didn't get to ask it, please feel free to reach out to me, just Kayvon at smarking.com. And obviously, if you are interested in trialing uh, AIM at one of your garages, then please get in touch and would, uh, would love to do that with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And again, uh, we've been recording this and we will have it up on our YouTube channel if you missed any of the parts and also on our blog. Uh, thank you all very much for attending the webinar. Uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.